am 1220 KHTS, your hometown station.com. You're listening to Dr. Proctor, a show we do every Thursday, an opportunity for us to look over the shoulders of the medical community, doctors and the support staff, maybe learn a little bit, get a, get a peek into their world to see what's happening as the population has more and more opportunity to see doctors because of the Affordable Health Care Act. Hospitals and, and, and urgent care and doctors' offices all incredibly impacted because people do have more chance to see a doctor, to see the nurses, the physician assistants. And as a result, this is sometimes it's, it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing because you do have to wait longer or you do uh, get to an emergency room where you have to wait maybe hours uh, to be seen. The more we can do for ourselves, the more we can keep an eye on our well-being and our loved ones, the, the better it will be. With me today, I have Lisa Solis. De, uh, Sol- I keep wanting to add an extra syllable in there, Lisa <laughs> DeLong, just Lisa DeLong. Um, but I also want people to look for her her books on um, on go and Google. You can find them at Amazon.com. Um, Lisa is a longtime. Um, member of the medical community, not just from her own training in years past and and who she, who she was in her an initial incarnation with medicine, but then also as she took care of her two sons over the years and has had m- multiple um, opportunities to to deal with the medical community. She has written a beautiful book about her her two boys, uh, Blood Brothers. You can can find that again on Amazon.com. We're also here with Paul. Pauline Matar, who has, she works with in Aloe Valley, Cedar sinai She's a PA, and we've been talking a little bit about how the the process, for, for starters, that, that, that long-range education process that she's gone through to be a PA, but also the things that led her to do that, and how beautifully the the PA uh, experience for a patient can dovetail with the optimum care from doctors and nurses. And again, Pauline, establish for me how many years uh, you've been in healthcare. Probably uh, if you started right out of high school and then you went out back to school to be a PA and that's been about four years you've been working in these uh, two facilities. Lisa... You started off as a nurse, and so I want to talk a little bit about your relationship, working-wise, uh, what you saw in as you were going, uh, you know, through your own career mm-hmm. uh, with doctors, and uh, we talked a bit about um, nurse practitioners, and then ultimately PAs. Did, in your experience, when you were working as a nurse, uh, was was that a thing, or that really came about a little later? It came about much later, actually. I graduated from nursing school in 1983, so in those days there were nurses and there were doctors <laughs> there wasn't there nothing were, in between there's nothing in between and to my recollection they if they existed i did not n- know about it it's and that's as, a missing chunk isn't it yes that they finally realized hmm somewhere in between there yeah and then in my experience i was aware of nurse practitioners um becoming a a um a profession um probably about i want to say maybe 15 years after graduating it was a while you know um uh, so nurses at the time, there were um, you could go into management um, and that kind of thing, but there weren't t- there there wasn't the extra skill set and um, licensing. So th- those those careers were created out of necessity because the the heavy load on physicians has been steadily increasing, and so. Nurse practitioners are licensed uh, under with to work under a physician to prescribe medicine and um, uh, diagnose and those kinds of things. There were also nurse anesthetists um, that who are specialized. So there were lo- there's lots of subspecialties within the field of nursing. Um, but I didn't really hear about f- um, physician's assistants until well after nurse practitioners were established in my experience. So. Um, as the patient load is demanding, becoming more demanding, and as the load on physicians is becoming intolerable, really, uh, for them, 
uh, these kinds of professions are, are being created to fill in the gaps. And, and that um, translates that, that, that load on the physicians while um, that, that's a terrible thing and we feel badly for the doctors. It's also not in the best interest of patient care. And, uh, and like I said, I, I love me some doctors and I want to see them protected because I think they're a special species too. But the idea that the patients are the ones who will ultimately suffer if they're not receiving optimum care and these uh, these these next levels of um, uh, medical practitioners, if you will, become so important. And so so now the physicians then because once the doctors were impacted, the nurse practitioners then became impacted. Now with affordable health care and everything else, that it's a trickle down you know theory where everyone's trying to carry a load that they, they really can no longer carry. And this is where I think PAs become. The the next really important step to patient care. Yeah, and Pauline, you can correct me if I'm wrong about that, about the, the establishment of, of, of physician's assistant. Like I said, it just wasn't in my realm of awareness at the time. But, um, you know, what, what I'm hearing overall, especially um, speaking nationally in the, the uh, Speakers Bureau that I'm on is called Studer Group. It's a leadership and management in healthcare company based in Pensacola, Florida. And Quint Studer, the founder, his big passion right now is to help um, alleviate physician burnout because, uh, you know, <laughs> doctors are people too. And um, just like nurses are people too, and PAs are people too. And, and they have their own medical conditions and stress related. Yes, and families and, you know, and, yeah. and running their businesses. And um, I, I talked to a physician at one point um, after speaking and he said that the um, the digital age has added so much strain on some of the older doctors because these things are you know computers and you know there's a learning curve there's a learning curve and because hospitals are notorious for changing their programs so often that um, and then nationalize you know the the national formats of you know check this box and that kind of thing so if they miss if they miss one box they don't check that box properly um, as they're filling in and taking care of patients and charging them correctly and diagnosing them correctly. If they don't hit the right button on the computer, they can lose hundreds of thousands of dollars for their private practice, for a hospital. I mean, it's so there they are. They've, they're trying to get to the patient. They're trying to diagnose and, and really hear the patient. And as patients, I don't think we do a very good job of communicating to our physicians. You know, I feel weird. Okay, well, what is weird? Right. <laughs> you know, and, and I feel funny. And this <laughs> is, <laughs> I'm a big fan of journaling before you go to the doctor so that you, the things, and you forget things. And there's such things as fatigue and and you are working on, you might, might like I told you, I came in today and my brain is so full. It's like, oh, I don't even know if I can, you know, br <laughs> bring it all down to focus. Going to the doctor, you know, yeah. you talk about white coat anxiety. That to me, that's the least of somebody's problems when suddenly they just sort of, their brain. F freezes yeah. because now they have to communicate and if you have it written down before then you can present it and say okay here's what I've been doing here's how I've been feeling it, and it is it's and doctors don't have all the time in the world to try to reel that out of you right you know so right. so this is and again that's where the the PAs real are so awesome and and um, the, the 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 um the physician's assistants and nurse practitioners and um, th when you have somebody who has the time to help you with that list, you know, of, you know, you've brought in your list of symptoms and they can help fine tune, point to where it hurts. When did it begin? Is it a sharp pain or a dull pain? And, and then they and know what really the doctor needs to hear. And really filter all of that down. And, and then when, you know, that's one thing, less thing that the physician has to do and can step in at that point and say, okay, this is what I'm understanding is, you know, and, and start communicating. So time, because time is money uh, in healthcare and everywhere else, um, you, you, to have somebody who speaks the language to both sides, so to the physician as well as to the patient, uh, and I think that's where the PAs do a really good job of I, kind of elite and and they you know there's a lot less white coat you know right that anxiety, anxiety. because right. um, there you know the you're, most of the time people are like I don't even know what a PA is <laughs> right right so so okay now talk to me Lisa you have a story uh, I, I'm so want to hear about how. Um, 
a PA in, in a nutshell saved your son's life. Tell That's tell me true. this story. So Jacob was um, the on treatment for chem- uh, for leukemia. He was six years old, and he had received his probably I want to say. 10th or 12th uh, lumbar puncture it was it's part of a they receive chemotherapy in their spinal fluid and uh, they go under anesthesia for that process so it's just like any other um, um, day surgery so you know same day surgeries where you're you're not allowed to eat or drink anything the night before you show up they um, the nest that they give you pro- propofol usually um, as an anesthesia um, and um, so Jacob went under, he had his procedure, and when he came out, um, everything seemed fine, He just like he had done every time. And then after that uh, procedure, he had to go upstairs to get chemotherapy uh, in another way through his IV. So um, he started to spike a fever suddenly, and um, uh, his heart was racing, and this happened very suddenly. It was, you know, he had recovered fully, and everything was fine. And um, our, this PA came in, who we just love. All the kids love him. And um, he diagnosed him, like, instantly as um, having aspirated while he was under. So he had um, aspirate pneumonia from um, just getting a little bit of fluid or mucus in his lungs while he was under anesthesia. So he, you know, they antibiotic him, they cultured his, um, his line, they did everything to to get him well again and he turned around and within 24 hours we were home. So, you know, it's that kind of skill that is acquired by being present in seeing patients over and over and over again. And that's the kind of person you want on your team when you're, especially if it's acute care, yeah, uh, and, and even if it's outpatient, you're seeing a, you know a, you're seeing the same doctor, or or you know you, for, you're seeing you have a chronic condition. You want somebody who sees you often, but also sees a lot of people often, because that's how we gain our skill as healthcare professionals: is seeing and getting a feel for how a person looks when they have one thing going on or another, and um, putting together all that symptomatology and saying, okay, this is how. This is, you know, I got this. I know what this is. And um, again, it's that great feeling of, ah, but it takes time. You know, it takes time. And so that's what the PAs, uh, I've, the PAs I've known are very good at that. Well, and then the, the time and also this is where it's critically important for the patient to understand the need to communicate with the PA Mm -hmm. because again I've been in situations where I've seen patients oh well I'll wait and talk to the doctor oh well I'll I'll tell the doctor please do not do that please speak to your nurses speak to the PA let them let them in let them be a part of your Mm -hmm. team and I think this is if any if any message could be conveyed today one it would be uh, that you need to communicate with every member of the team that comes in to to give you care and also uh, if I could encourage the anyone thinking of that next career step or that next school step this this is, is this is a field to consider Pauline in your uh, experience as a PA can can you give us an example of what was maybe um, that that one of the one of the be- one of the I don't want to say the best story but maybe the the biggest most impactful story where you realize you made a difference in in patient care even the, the the simplest, most subtle stories, if if it's not that you know that that big um, television worthy moment, mm-hmm. but maybe even that that small quiet moment where you realized that your job made uh, a difference in somebody's care. Well, I mean, I see it day in and day out. So many patients come in and they've gone to multiple people, different doctors, uh, and they can't quite figure out what's going on and uh, I was actually telling Lisa a story uh, about this Um, I've had patients come in and they're like nobody can figure out what's going on and you know sit there and talk to them and sometimes just hearing something differently can make a a huge impact as well and um, I love being a PA because I get to be able to spend time with my patients and get to listen to what they have to say and sometimes just having a few more extra minutes makes a a little bit of a difference but um, I Every day, it's it's an adventure, and 
every day I'm getting a chance to help you know somebody out um, I have lots of stories there's no, nothing really pops out because there's so but many every day there's a story yeah. where you where you finish your day and you could go you, that you, was good I, I have because I remember you telling me this story so if it's safe for you to say it in a non divulging way about um, it was a head injury um, and you noticed some things and then they did the um, scan and then that was discovered do you remember that one that you told me about? So I had a, a young uh, female patient come in and uh, she had a head injury and it was a few hours out and, you know, they came in with the parents and they were just like, we just want to make sure everything's okay and, and make sure, you know, she, she hit her head uh, and something just seemed a little different about her and she didn't seem like she was acting completely right for me. Uh, I was speaking with one of my colleagues and they're like, oh, you, normally we would just monitor but uh, I just had this gut instinct to, I was like, something's not sitting right. I'm going to scan her. And sure enough, she had a pretty significant brain bleed and a skull fracture. Wow. Um, so we ended up having to fly her out to uh, another facility that you well, there's your handle, mo so. There's your moment. You're humble. Well, Pauline is very humble. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Like so many healthcare professionals are. And so I was like, no, you got to tell that one. That was a good one. <laughs> and, and this was not a patient you had seen before. It was uh, no. in, But in the moment, you felt like something was, was off and you, you noticed you were a part of that. And the other thing, T, that I have to share is like when Pauline t told me that story, you know, she's in my kitchen and where she's, she's like, oh, guess what happened last night? I mean, her the, the light in her eyes was like sparkling and, you know, she was all lit up because that's how it is for us like mm. when you do that when you, you when you're the one that you know saves the day you know you you get that's why we that's why she was up all night and hasn't slept and does and I, this day in and day out because I'm, of that the, the the love of it and i do i do want to to make sure i mean so many people will go into a healthcare facility or an emergency room and uh, there are times when you you look around and you see the people in the scrubs and the uniforms and you think, oh, this is their job. For so many, for more than I've than I've ever really I could count, it's not just a job. They are there for the love of the patient, the love of what they do, that that ability to to help and to save and to you know comfort. There are so many levels of of that, and I and I and I again I'm I am surprised that you worked all night you, till six thirty this morning, and and you're here today to talk to us about something that you're very passionate about that you that you care about again we're talking with Pauline Matar and Lisa Solis DeLong who both in the in the years of, of medical care have uh, Lisa I've talked to you on so many different occasions where even where the the medical situations were personal you still love the 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 healthcare community and what they do on behalf of of patients and and that I I'm, I find that admirable too because I I, I feel you have every reason to to not, you know, be their cheerleader. Mm -hmm. You have every reason to say, you know what, this is not something I ever want to deal with again, but that's not who you are. You, you really continue on to make sure that other people receive optimum care, that they have that compassionate, that, 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 the, the 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 level of involvement from the healthcare community is is admirable that, that you're asking for. So well, it's really interesting because uh, I, there was a period of time after my son, my older son, died. Justin died 15 years ago, and there was a period of three years where I just could not step foot in a hospital. I just couldn't do it. The most I, repugnant the, thing yeah, the imaginable. Sound, especially the sound of IV pumps. Um, Justin had a lot of chemo. And and um, so the sights and smells and just the feel of a hospital were, was something I couldn't handle. And so I think that was wise of me to allow myself in my state of grief to um, to reevaluate what I was about. And um, But at the three-year mark, I did get the urge to go back into nursing. And I went back for a year, you know, did mother baby. And then I... Um, quickly found out that was not a good fit for me anymore because all I wanted to do was talk about death and death related things. And so um, that's when I um, found um, nonprofit work was was great to help with other with kids with cancer. But um, at this junction in my life, um, I'm very I, I love healthcare professionals. Like when I get to speak to um, a whole healthcare system, I'm I'm in my happy place. I really am and um, and nurses and um, 
and, and I, it matters. I'm I'm passionate about it because you know I I still have a I mean th this is uh, somewhat selfish, but you know I still have a cancer survivor child, and um, you know Dave and I are getting older. My husband and I are getting older. All of us are getting older, and I have nieces that are having babies. My niece had a, a little preemie th two weeks ago. Uh, 31 weeks old. He's he was two pounds 13 ounces, um, and I went to the you know in the NICU to see the baby, the neonatal intensive care unit, and it was like a factory. I was astounded at how big this NICU was, and um, all these little tiny babies in clear glass boxes. It looks like you know babies in boxes. They weren't glass, but it's the anyways, baby garden. It was it was almost sci-fi. You know, like if like my old school nursing experience of you know being in a special care nursery back in at county hospital. This was like this high tech. There's monitors. There's computer screens. It's you know, and the and the fabulous medical team. You know, there's respiratory therapists and there's physical therapists and there's nurses and there's um, neonatologists and and they're all just buzzing around in their scrubs and their Crocs and they're just <laughs> making it all happen. You know, and I was I mean, if you if you ever saw that in like you know the the tubes, the teeny tiny microtubes, the teeny tiny little um, portable chest X rays. And all it's this like stuff. a miniature a miniature. It's, and it made me so, I just, I just was, and honestly, when I found out my niece was having this situation, she had to have an emergency C-section, I, I just prayed for their team. I prayed for her medical team instantly, her, her medical team praying for wisdom and, um, sensitivity that they were well rested and well fed and um we're you know we, you care about it when it matters and it the matters. rest of the time in your life you're like oh i'll never need any of that and when you do <laughs> you really it's good to do. know they're there yeah you're listening to dr proctor on your hometown station am 1220 khts we'll be back after these messages you're listening to dr proctor on your hometown station am 1220 khts we are here every thursday with an hour opportunity to peek over the shoulders of the medical community learn a little bit about what they do, what they do for us, and what we can do to help them and to facilitate better communication, better relationships, so that we receive the optimum health care, not just for us, for our loved ones. And the, the better working relationship we have, the better. And today we're talking with Pauline Matar and Lisa Solista Long is here with us to talk about what it is to be a PA and how critically important PAs are to the doctor relationship, the doctor-nurse practitioner, nurse relationship and how really to the patient and and the ultimate care that we can receive how that is so critically important and Pauline I, again I want to thank you for working all night coming in and talking with us a bit about what it is um, before we take our break I would like uh, I would like you to again recap what your role is in the medical community as a PA so my job as a PA is to you know, provide patient care and uh, you know do the best I can for each and every patient I see and uh, help facilitate if if need be. Um, we being a PA, we are overseen by physicians, so we do do a lot on our own. We can do procedures, we can write prescriptions, we can see patients, do physicals. Um, we we can do a, a lot and. And uh, and it's great that we have so many things and that we can do. But again, we we still have the care of a physician that supervises. So at the end of the day, when we have questions, we have these doctors that are there for us and that are always willing that, to help us out. And uh, and and we definitely do use utilize them as need be. Um, and and our job is just to help take care of each and every patient that comes in and give them the best care that we can, as individualized as possible, but in a timely fashion. Because everyone's everyone has a medical complaint, everyone has a medical emergency in the emergency room, and uh, everyone obviously they everyone has their own problems and they don't see anybody else's problems uh, because you know everyone's. We're all focused on ourselves, which is completely understandable. And with the healthcare the way it is and the wait times, I mean, people are waiting four or five hours to be seen by a provider. And we, we all work very hard to try to see everyone as, you know, as, as quickly and as efficiently as we can. And, and as a PA, you can help help the, the healthcare process. You can help that until a specialist is required or a doctor who is of a particular field. This is one of the things that I think is so critically important for a patient to hear that when you 
go to this medical facility and you are being seen by a PA, know that you are in the best hands. And if there is a need to to turn the patient over to, again, a doctor of a particular field or specialty, then that will happen. But there, there's, there's no minimalizing. There's no, there's no deferring. I, I, you, you as a, as a PA are, are the first line of defense in the best possible outcome for a patient. With, and, and Lisa, you've said it before, a PA saved your son's life. Mm -hmm. And yes. if, if you can have that kind of care when you walk in through the doors and you know you're being seen by a PA, you should be very happy that that you are you are in very good hands. And again, the, the wingman to, to the other uh, hospital um, you know, faculty. And mm -hmm. so again, Pauline, thank you so much for being here today and thank talking you. to us on, on, on very little fuel. I know. <laughs> and Lisa, your expertise and your input, uh, always, always invaluable. I'm, I'm grateful uh, for that. And it, before we wrap up, tell me again, uh, the, the book title where people can get it and how they can find you. It's called blood brothers. Uh, it's a memoir of faith and loss uh, of, while having two sons with cancer and it's on Amazon. Uh, it's other places too, but Amazon's the easiest. And uh, I also started a blog called Grief Dance, which has to do with um, dealing with grief um, and the, how the healing power of dance within um, t as a form of expression. And all this crazy emotion that's coming out of me as I'm preparing for a um, a pro am. I'm going to compete in a Love that. hustle dance in Miami. It's a, it's a hustle salsa conference, and the first for me. I've never done this, so it's kind of crazy. That. It's stressing me out a bit, but it's well, a lot of fun. You're going to be <laughs> fine. And I do want to point out that grief isn't always just something that we go through in the process of of losing a loved one. It can often be just in the process of receiving a diagnosis or an illness. And and myself, I know from experience when my son was diagnosed with autism, incredible grief that came with that. Mm -hmm. So. If, if you're listening and, and you would like to learn more, it's uh, the blog is called Grief Dance. All right, Lisa, thank <laughs> you so much for being here. Pauline Matar, thank you also. Thank you. You're listening thank to you. Dr. Proctor here on your hometown station, AM 1220, KHDS.